I created a, a Frankenstein parent. I had taken all of those pieces from different parents and stuck them together into one parent. And that's what I was judging myself against. Instead of taking this amalgamation and making a monster out of it, I should sit back and say, what's important to me as a parent? What kind of life do I want to show my kids? Something that is really important to me with with the boys is that they feel comfortable in their own skins, uh, that they are confident about who they are as a person. Hi there, and welcome to the Living Richly podcast. We're so grateful that you joined us again today. Uh, we are so excited about our special guest uh, that we are going to have on the show today, Rob Smith. Uh, Rob is the author of multiple books. He's a keynote speaker. He is a teacher. He is the owner of a branding co- company. In fact, this is the guy who designed the branding that we use for all of the Living Richly stuff. Uh, this is the guy who created it. Rob, so great to have you here on the show with us. Thank you so much. This is cer- certainly a, a pleasure, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Oh, we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you. Uh, and, you know, if we think about your story, you have such a powerful story, Rob, uh, of both triumph and tragedy. Uh, you've reached incredible success um, with all of the accolades and awards, and yet you've also struggled with self-worth and imposter syndrome, which uh, we did a show not, too long, not too long ago on imposter syndrome. So we're going to get on, into all of that, but uh, let's just start at the beginning. If we start to think about your early artistic beginnings, um, can you describe or think about your childhood fascination with artistic expression and what kind of mediums did you enjoy the most? Well, as a child, um, I just, I loved any medium really. Um, and I loved painting. I loved drawing. Um, I loved um, acting and, uh, just a very, anything that involved creativity, uh, was my, uh, was my passion for sure. What was it like though? So uh, how was that being expressed? What were some of the things that you were doing? Uh, when you look back, we talk so often that so much of what we are today is shaped in what we did and how, what we believed and all of those things when we were children, uh, what were some of the things you believed and were doing in those moments? So a lot of times, uh, again, as, as children, I, f- I felt I was very fortunate to feel very free to express myself. So, uh, sometimes that was through, uh, painting. I painted, you know, landscapes and, um, uh, figure drawings, things like that. Um, watercolor, um, oil. It really didn't matter to me. Uh, whatever was handy and close by, I would, I would use. And, um, really at that age, there was no, um, set, uh, approach or subject matter. Um, it was just getting something out of my head and onto a surface of some kind. I love that. I love how you talk about having the freedom to express. So if you talk about the freedom that you experienced um, in that childhood phase, uh, what impact did your family's support or the people around you have on nurturing that creativity? So that's where, again, I was very fortunate. I kind of won the lottery uh, in the family that I was born into in that they supported my artistic endeavors no matter what. Uh, my mother is a classical pianist. Uh, my father, uh, is, or was in, um, sales. And, uh, uh, so, uh, I was nurtured at a young age, always given whatever I needed, whatever I wanted, um, and the freedom to, uh, to express myself. Uh, so it was, it was, uh. It was a great childhood from that perspective. I love that. I'm like picturing you now, like kind of hippie world and you're just sitting on a mountainside, (laughs) just kind of all this free flowing and everything like that in your life. We were hippies, really. Uh, You had longer hair then? Oh, I had hair. Let's just start there. (laughs) Uh, One of the, one of the interesting things about uh, for you was going from that, that free flowing kind of openness and everything like that. And then you talk about the notion of going into high school and the rigidity of the school system. It's interesting. I know that I I don't know if Eric and I've ever talked about it on a show. We certainly hold to some of the same beliefs around some of the challenges of our current, the way that our school systems are designed are certainly they're not designed to support creatives like yourself. Uh, And what was that like as you started to move into 
uh, high school and with all this desire for creativity to suddenly be experiencing the rigidity of the school system? Yeah, so uh, high school was incredibly difficult um, for me, and it really is to this day a source of my imposter syndrome, and it's still part of um, it really battered down my uh, self-esteem um, because um, there is no room for self-expression. There is no room for creativity because you are marked for specifics. Uh, the answer is right or it's wrong. And uh, it's it's something that I really struggled with because I'm very much about interpretation. Um, and it's something that is part of my um, career and my creative adulthood is that idea of interpretation, of understanding, and coming out with solutions that are are unique. And high school is absolutely not about being unique um, in the school, but also with peer pressure and with the students. It, it's interesting because, and I, and uh, you, you're right. Our school systems are designed in such a way to, uh, you regurgitate information, right? Your, 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 your quizzes, your tests are most often about just give us the answer that we've already told you, uh, you're supposed to, how you're supposed to answer something. Uh, and now here you are just, you know, kind of in that creativity, trying to figure that kind of stuff out. Um, what was the bigger challenge for you? Was it the, uh, uh, was it the kind of kind of fitting into that model, or as you mentioned about not only struggling there, but also with the friends, with the community, with the people around you? What was the what was the challenge there between the two? Yeah, so I, again, we're all um, products of our environment, and when we look at the high school uh, environment. It is done and divided up into cliques. It's divided into you know that that thinking that the school is teaching you trickles down, and so it becomes very defined and then you get uh, segregated into groups or you're you're a jock or you're a geek or you're you know and and for me it was never about that i had friends that were jocks i had friends that were um geeks and and uh, i never understood that and therefore i never really fit into one group uh for that reason Mm. um in terms of as you continued through high school uh, and then, you know, we're continuing to discover your passion. What would you say, Rob, led you to pursue design? And you just knew like, this is what I want to, this is what I want to do. Um, and how did it transform your outlook uh, on your education and your career as you move through those stages of life? Uh, so that's a, that's a great question because for me, that was uh, what changed my life. Um, I had a, uh, again, doing my art, um, I was finishing off high school and I had a guidance counselor that was recognizing the work that I was doing and called me to his office one day and said, uh, you should be a graphic designer. And I said, awesome. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I remember it vividly, he pulled out a book, uh, design annual and started flipping through the pages. And it was that, uh, you know, that, that epiphany moment, that light bulb, I looked at this and I remember it specifically, I looked back at him and I said, this is a job. And he said, yes. I said, I could get paid to do this. And he said, yes. And it was, it was just, it was incredible to me. And um, he helped me fill out, uh, choose a college to go to, fill out my registration and, and, and application. And uh, I'm, so that was the pivotal thing there. But then added on to that was the fact that I had to move out of home to another city. And so what I was able to do was pursue something that I was passionate about. But I was also in an environment where nobody knew me. I didn't have any baggage. I could completely reinvent myself. And going from, I think I graduated with a 64 average, just something that from high school, to an A-plus on the president's list. Um, uh, vice president of the student body, it was an incredible metamorphosis. It was a renaissance for me. Um, so that when that door opened, I just went through it and embraced everything that was around there and still to this day. Mm, I love there, that. There are so many nuggets that I want to unpack and what you just said there, but maybe just I'm going to zero in on again that that guidance teacher, that 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 uh support that you had there. Um talk about how powerful we we often talk about the influencers in our lives, the people who who speak life into us, who encourage us and challenge us. And I see that in you as somebody who is 
and we'll certainly get into you know what you're doing today. Uh, but you are a big believer in mentoring others. Uh, you know, um, uh, for you know, most people wouldn't know this, but you, you and I have known each other for a lot of years. You were one of the very first coaching clients that I had way back uh, in the day, and we have worked together uh, on and off over the years. And I have always seen you as somebody who has absolutely been a believer in not only taking in being mentored by someone, but also mentoring other people. Maybe talk a little bit about that, what you learned there. And it sounds like maybe that was a starting point for you, this person who influenced you and how you've taken and embraced that and continually do that for others today. Yeah, that's excellent. Absolutely, Rob. And it's something that has followed through my career. Obviously, uh, we need to build our career and reputation in this industry, uh, build a portfolio, clients and things like that. But as I went through, um, I started teaching at college at a very young age. Um, I was in my early thirties and, um, late twenties, early thirties. And, um, I want to see other people have that moment that I had. Uh, I want to have, because the school system hasn't changed. It has not changed. And so to this day, I do, uh, speeches and presentations at high schools and I'm looking for those eyes because there's always at least three or four from the audience. Suddenly their eyes pop out because I'm showing them work and how much, uh, enjoyment and how much of a privilege what I do for a living is. Um, and I see those eyes and that's, you know, I don't get paid to do those. Um, and that's the payment for me is like, okay, good. I want to catch those people who feel undervalued, um, who feel that they don't have something to present to society because they're not, uh, you know, into the mass or into the sciences and that, and they feel very, um, you know, there's a lot of depression, um, and it erodes your self-confidence and I don't want to see that. So I want to find these people and give them, you know, that, like fire up that passion, um, in them. Um, that's, uh, you know, and right now, not only with high schools, but I also uh, do this mentoring thing online. So I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with people in Nigeria and in China and, uh, and all these countries, um, just little half hour sessions. And that's what they come around to. Doesn't matter your gender, your geographical uh, location, your income level, none of those things. All of these people struggle with the same thing. And that is the self identity and struggling with what do I give back? Uh, to the world. And, um, and, and I want to really spark that passion that I have um, in others. I love that. I think, you know, just hearing you speak, Rob, I, oh, you can God, hear it in his voice. I just, hey, yeah. you know, the world needs more people like that. And I, you know, influer influencers, um, spark lighters, whatever, whatever you want to call them. But I think especially coming out of COVID and even though we're four years past COVID, you know, if I just think about high schools or just people in general who've kind of lost their way and their spark and, and their light is so dim that, you know, they're, they're waiting for someone or something to light that spark back up in them. And I just, I, I just love that you're able to give back and, and, um, influence people that way. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, Talking about that though, and 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 I know you mentioned it a couple minutes ago around that imposter syndrome uh, piece, which you know I think that's something that we all struggle with and we all you know try to navigate through. But how has self doubt, imposter syndrome, whatever you want to call it, shaped your career, and what role did that have for you? Uh, or, or how did that play out in your achievements uh, and relationships? Imposter syndrome and self doubt. I think a lot of us struggle with that, um, and it's a matter of coming up with um, our own individual tools and approaches through um, experiencing it with others. And I did a lot of research, different writers, different presenters, different people online, on how they approach it. And that's one thing I discovered was. And I think it does apply to most people. It is for me, the core of imposter syndrome is the fact that we're not psychic. And imposter syndrome is all about assumption. It's all about, they're not going to like me. They're not going to like this. They're not going to accept this. I don't want them. They're going to, it's all projection 
and assumptions on behaviors of others who we have no control over. The only person we have control over is ourselves. And so if we think of the fact that this is something I remind myself when I have a presentation to go to a meeting, I'm like, I don't know if they're going to like this. I stop and say, you're not, you're not psychic. And like, yeah, okay, you're, you know what, you're right. Um, you can only show up as your genuine self. And, and that's something that's been really, really um, important to me, a big struggle, certainly. Um, but uh, again, understanding that, how has it affected my career? Well, um, it, it has a small side benefit to it, which is um, you're always uh, pushing forward. Right. You're always pushing yourself because, okay, yeah, that was great. What have you done lately? Right. And you push, push, push to improve, to get better. Um, and, um, that's, that's where this has, 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 I guess, helped me in a sense. The imposter syndrome is like, okay, well, um, it, it's, it's somewhat humbling. Right. Uh, if you ever, I, what I feel is if you ever reach a point in your career where you think I'm the best at what I do, you should quit that and start something else. Because you're no longer relevant, you can no longer learn. Ooh, that's powerful. And I, I think of, I love that notion of psychic. I'm going to steal that and start to use it and say, as I always used to say, uh, <laughs> but because it, it, it fits right into certainly one of the things that I do often, uh, talk about, certainly with clients, uh, in personal lives, uh, in our, in our personal life is around the, the, it's the Stephen Covey's, uh, you know, seven habits. It's around what's within my control, what's in my, my sphere of influence, what's outside of my control. And that's to your point. What's outside of my control is how someone's going to respond to what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation. What's within my control, what's within my influence is do the best damn job that I'm capable of doing and then see how people respond to it is outside of that control. Uh, and so the more you focus in on what you have control over, the more that oftentimes removes the uh, burden of the imposter syndrome uh, and being able, allows you kind of some freedom on that. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think the biggest lesson that I learned was from my brother-in-law, um, who is a former Olympian and, um, he went to two Olympics. And when I was doing research and building my second book, I was looking at, again, how people deal with imposter syndrome and things like that. So I thought, well, he's been at the highest of the high. He's been to the Olympics. How do you deal with that? So when I asked him, I said, how do you deal when you're up against the best in the world? And you've got your race ahead of you. How do you deal with that? And he simply said, well, I don't think about them. And I said, what do you mean? He said, no. He said, I'm, I have no control over their pace. If they're well, if they're unwell, if they're well-trained, if they're not well-trained. That I go in, whether it's the Olympics, a local race, a national race, I go in with the same mindset is that I want to do a better time than I did last time. Because that's the only thing I'm in control of. Better my best. And so that was powerful for me and it was not the uh um answer i was expecting at all <laughs> um and, but it was a, it was the best answer and that's another thing that i always keep in mind is okay when i start going online and looking at other people's portfolios and going oh my god you know it's like okay you know where are you personally where are you at uh, that fits into, I think, what you often do uh, when you're training in a group training. I hear you say it all the time is don't worry about what the person besides is running. Don't worry about, you know, you're competing against yourself. You're yeah. challenging yourself. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is it's you against you, not you against everyone else. But as humans, we naturally have a tendency to uh, drift out of our lane instead of staying in our own lane, kind of focusing on what everyone else is doing, which then starts to chip away at our self-worth, our self-confidence, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, and then, and then, then your energy starts to dip to a point where you feel like, well, why bother anyways? Because I'm never going to be uh, X, Y, and Z. You've written a couple of books, right? So here you are, you are like this rock star. You've won all these awards. You're doing all this <laughs> great branding. You're, you know, you, you, you're teaching students. You're, and then you write a couple of books. Uh, and you're, you, you can't even, you're so creative and artistic. You can't even write a book with a normal title. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. 
Very true. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the books for a minute because I think that the mess it fits in here, especially uh, Frankenstein condition uh, uh, and and imposter syndrome and and uh, just the kind of the idea behind it. What's the message of of uh, of the Frankenstein condition and 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 how is that relevant to people who are struggling with identity, struggling with understanding, kind of how they show up, all of the things we've been talking about so far, far. Yeah, so basically the Frankenstein condition actually started out as the Frankenstein parent. Um, and it was my exercise of trying to um, unpack my feelings as a horrible parent. I felt I was like just doing the worst things to my my kids. And I needed to intellectualize that. Why was I feeling this way? And it's not like breaking an armory you put a cast on it, right? It's, it's There's no concrete remedy. And and so to, um, and again, because of what I do is, you know, problem solving uh, for a living, it's like, okay, how do I contextualize what I'm going through so that I can better understand it? And what I realized was at the time I was a scout leader and a soccer coach. So I was meeting a whole bunch of other parents. And so one parent, um, their kids were really good at school. And another one, they were um, always great at sports. And then another one, they were out camping with their kids. And then the other ones, their kids were popular at school. And so what I realized, what I had done was I'd created a, a Frankenstein parent. I had taken all of those pieces from different parents and stuck them together into one parent. And that's what I was judging myself against. When I realized that the intellectual family, their kids did not do sports at all. They couldn't hit a ball for, you know, any money. Uh, the sports kids, their kids didn't do great at school. They didn't get high marks. Um, the, you know, the camping family, well, they didn't have a lot of friends because they were always out camping in that. So it suddenly gave me the permission to say, you know what, instead of taking this amalgamation and making a monster out of it, I should sit back and say, what's important to me as a parent? What kind of life, um, uh, do I want to show my kids? What is available to them in life? And for me, it was, you know, Canadian dad, I did give them the opportunity to um, play hockey. They weren't interested. Um, so I thought, oh, okay. So we got them heavily into scouts. What I loved about that is so many different activities. They got all of these different things that they could do. And to me, that showed that life is about opportunity and finding who you are not being told what you are by the school system or whatever. It was like, oh, you know, and I've got two boys uh, and they're just wonderful human beings. And, um, you know, one's an, uh, an electrical engineer and the other one's a uh, uh, police foundation. So once I get into the RCMP and that, so very different from, <laughs> from what I do. And I'd celebrate that because what I feel is where their paths have led them are genuine to them. Because we don't have electrical engineers in the family. We don't have RCB or police in the family. We don't. So obviously, to me, this demonstrates that they found what is theirs. Mm, I love that. I love that just being able to hear you embrace, you know, as you raised your kids, um, what they liked and helping them by shaping experiences in them, which I think is just so key. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, uh, yeah, come, jump in. Hey, so. So the Frankenstein parent, when I was started writing it, that was for myself, but then I wrote it. Um, and then I realized, you know what? We do this as uh, sons and daughters. We do this as spouses. We do this in our careers. So I took out parent and I just made it the Frankenstein condition because we do this in all aspects of our lives. We do. And, and thank you. Cause that's where I was about to go is I was going to tie it into where the book eventually landed, which was the recognition of, of this is so natural. It's such in, ingrained in us when we compare ourselves. We're, we're, we're rarely do we compare ourselves to an, e, to the, to the equal. We compare ourselves to your point to, to all of the different scenarios. And we say, Oh, well, if you put all that together, then I don't measure up. Well, no kidding. No one measures up when you try to do it from that standpoint. And so it's finding the, uh, comparing yours, comparing equally is, is often what's difficult. What are some of the things that you would, uh, suggest as kind of those first steps for somebody who's there and they're like, Holy shit. 
Rob, this is me. Uh, I am absolutely that Frankenstein where I've put together all of these other images and I'm comparing myself to that. How do they get away from that and back to the the self-acceptance and the love, the radical uh, love that they have internally? Um, what would some, be some of the uh, steps that you would suggest as starting points? Well, I think for me, um, what's really important is you've got to get this stuff out of your head and down on paper. Um, for two reasons. One is it takes it out of your head. Secondly, it makes it real. It's staring back at you. Um, so what I suggest people do is you get a piece of paper, a uh, lined paper, and you draw a line down the middle of it. And one column is lies and one column is truths. And so if you find yourself one day coming home and saying, oh, wow, I really screwed up that meeting, um, write that down on the lies part. What's the truth out of that? Well, the truth might be, yeah, the uh, the PowerPoint broke down. I didn't have a proper PDF to put it through. So we've personified it, right? So as I screwed up that meeting, uh, that's the lie. The truth is technology kind of screwed it up. You didn't. Um, so, And that's just a, not a great example, but it's that kind of thing. So what is a, what is a lie that you're telling yourself? And what's the actual truth? Um, and when we start breaking it down like that, it really becomes powerful because it, again, like I said, it's staring at you. Yeah. I think, I think it's a great example actually, because I think, uh, so I'm a big believer in writing things down and as humans, we're very visual and visual is memorable. So by right, by doing a simple extra and I also think we overcomplicate the shit out of trying to decipher what's going on in our head. So I love that. I'm actually going to pass that on to one of my daughters. Uh, I love that exercise because I think it's simple and it just allows you to be able to visualize what the actual truth is instead of the stories that you're telling yourself. Your second book, Stop Looking at Zebras. Like I don't I like know zebras. if I ever but I don't know if I ever started looking at zebras. What if I like zebras though? Yeah, what if you like zebras? Why are you being such a jerk? Why are you so mad? Why why do you hate zebras, Rob? As a young <laughs> child, I was traumatized by zebras. <laughs> um, you know those those carousels that go above you? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when you're near the crib. Well, one of the zebras fell off. It got untied and it fell on my face. <laughs> Um, uh, no. Uh, so the first book was for everybody. Um, you know, the first I could say condition, uh, this book, uh, it was funny because when my dad found out I was writing a book, it's like, Oh, what is it about design that you're going to write about? And I said, it has nothing to do with design. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> um, so the second book, and at the time I thought, I'm not going to write about design. I got 30 years behind me. Sure. But I don't want to see another portfolio book out there. Here's pretty pictures of beautiful things that I've made. And it's like, no, that's not what this is about. Right. So after getting Frankenstein condition done, I then dove deeply into, um, a career in the creative industry and how it beats you up and how there's expectations and, and, uh, it's not mathematical. So coming up with solutions and that is, is organic, uh, uh, and less structured. Uh, so, um, again, going back to me wanting people to have a full and beautiful life and career in, in creativity. Um, that's what this book is. It's kind of a, a love letter, uh, to, to what I do. And so the zebras actually is a quote for, um, interns, uh, medical interns in their first year. They learn the quote, if you hear hoofbeats, don't think zebra, think horse. And it's basically the core of it is don't overcomplicate. Wendy, you brought this up, right? Don't overcomplicate. And as the creatives, we tend to do that. We want the 100% original idea and we chase that. And the reality is that doesn't exist anymore. Also, we're in, we're in creative communications, right? So even if we did come up with that 100% original idea, it would fall flat because the general public don't like new. They don't know what to do with new. You need to take the new and wrap it in the familiar. They need context. So showing them a zebra is like, um, you know, if they were expecting, uh, we're going to a horse race and there's, you know, and they're waiting for the zebras to show up. Well, you know, don't overcomplicate. And so that's one chapter. These, the book is, it is, uh, observations and rants about this industry. And that's one of the key things is, you know, giving yourself permission to be inspired 
by other artists, by other designers, by the world around you. And that, and I, you know, the example is Apple, you know, nothing they created was new. It was all pre-existing technology, always everything. They just did it better. So give yourself permission to move forward. I love that. It's, it's interesting. One of the things that I do as a, you know, as a business coach, I, if you were to look at my subscribers or, or the, my fault, the people I'm following, whether it's on uh, Instagram or even YouTube channels, uh, uh, I am often following other people who do what I do because I want to be inspired by, by what I'm learning, what I'm discovering from them. I'm, I'm not trying to come in and reinventing things completely. I'm trying to build upon other ideas, right? Uh, what's the classic marketing thing? Marketing, you know, marketing is stealing somebody else's idea and just making it better, right? It's, it's uh, in so many ways. I love that. And, and, and even in life, sometimes we feel so guilty, uh, when we're trying to do something or where sometimes imposter syndrome comes into play is we think, oh, I'm just trying to be like someone else versus no, I'm learning from them and I'm trying to now incorporate what's, what am I, what can I take from what someone else is doing, apply to my life, apply to what I do and just do it in more authenticity, more, more authentically, uh, and more in more real, right? It would not be how you see it. Absolutely. And even quite literally my book title, that's taken from somebody else. That's a quote from the intern in that. I just said, stop looking for zebras, you know? Um, so, and that was the basis, uh, the genesis of my book. And the first quote in it is from Dr. Seuss. Oh, the thinks you will think, um, you know, it, it says, these are just beautiful things that surround us that we don't, we don't absorb enough that we don't, uh, cause we're too busy chasing the technology. Mm, I love that. Um, just kind of tying all of this back into creativity and then talking a little bit about uh, your legacy and those life lessons um, and then, you know, bringing that back to your kids. Uh, Rob, what life lessons do you hope to impart to your two sons, especially regarding uh, creativity and self-awareness? And that's something that is really important to me with, with the boys is that they feel comfortable in their own skins uh, that they are confident about who they are as a person. Um, and uh, that's something that I really, um, on every level, all of them growing up, uh, those years um, is taken to do activities. I remember um, taking them to the National Gallery um, when they were six and eight. And my ex said, uh, you're going to bring them to an art gallery? They're going to get bored. And I said, that's fine. I want to expose them to it. And if, you know, if they're bored when we get there, we're going to leave and go for lunch and have fun. We were there for three hours. It was fantastic. You know, they were asking questions and they're why this and why that. And, and it just opened up to great conversation about interpretation. Uh, and that's what was nice about, you know, showing them art is there's no right or wrong answer, you know, and they, well, what does this painting mean? And I said, what does it mean to you? How do you feel when you look at it? Um, you know, and I can give them art history. Uh, and I did a little bit, uh, uh, the why, you know, why are all these paintings dark? Well, it was during a war time and you know, that's the, what they were feeling. How do you feel? So, uh, legitimizing, um, their feelings. Um, and cause we can get, particularly with art galleries, you get kind of, um, you, you feel intimidated going, well, there's a Picasso. It's like, I don't get it. It's like, well, it's not about getting it. it, it it's, it's about how do you feel? I don't like it. There you go. That's what it's about. You don't let it get, but why? Mm, I love that. What a great way to help them identify self-expression, but also be able to um, be able to express and experience conversation. Uh, I, I just, I love that example of taking your kids to the art gallery and just what that can uh, do in terms of not just building your relationship with your sons, but being able to hear from their perspective and foster that conversation and dynamic. I think that's amazing. And if, and it, it goes even further than that, cause it's, we live in a world right now that is so 
uh, take sides, right? We, 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 yeah, you're, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. Uh, it, it's, it's it. And, and to allow for, and to get back to, and perhaps this is where the, the creative and the artistic, uh, can help lead, uh, lead us back to is this notion of that there are many answers. There's, you know, uh, at the risk of being cliche ish, there's many shades of gray and, and, and to be able to come in and recognize that, we can have conversations, we can have opinions, we can embrace those with differing ideas without one having to be right and one having to be wrong. And it's wonderful. One of the things I enjoy the most about teaching, because I teach part-time at the college level, is giving um, a room of 20 students the same briefing um, and then seeing all of the different explorations, all the different approaches, and that I love. Um, the unfortunate thing in that process is that I have to assign a mark to it, which is, and that's something I tell my students is forget the marks, forget the marks. It's the school needs some sort of a, a baseline, but when you're putting your portfolio together and when you're looking at your work, disregard the marks. Um, I've, I've had students with eight pluses that I felt were not great designers. They were great at doing homework. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you uh so i again I, i've known you a long time and so i know this is really legit about you again you've i tease you about you know you're this uh you everything you do you're so great you've written all this stuff uh that legitimately doesn't go to your head like you get awards you get all of the accolades uh and and you've even you've used the language with me in the past that those are just byproducts those are those are not what you're aiming for. It's not what you're chasing. You're not trying to be the guy that everybody looks to and, you know, kind of falls uh, on their, you know, worship you and everything like this. What is it that you're chasing? What is it that is success for you? Um, what I'm chasing is uh, I, I'm chasing the next solution. I'm chasing the next thing, the next way to express going back to my childhood. It's like, what's in the room here? I got some watercolor paint and some paper from the printer. Okay, let's go. Um, you know, I'm constantly, I've got my phone with me and I'm constantly when I'm out about doing things, sending myself notes, uh, saying, Hey, what about this? What about that? You know, and I'll doodle it down. Uh, so I got post-it notes and things like that. So for me, it's that next challenge. It's that next, um, um, a uh, creative uh, problem solving uh, situation. Uh, and that might be through meeting a client who needs a new brand that might be working on my third book, um, which I may or may not be doing. I can't confirm nor deny. It's going to be about cows. I hope it's going to be about cows. Like zebras sounds great. Let's make it about cows or hamsters. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> this one's called three cushions and a blanket. Ooh. Oh, you'll even like that even more. Well, I love that. I'm all about the cushions and the blankets. <laughs> so it's about um, how um, it's 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 basically an essay on, on the third space. The first space in our world is home. The second space is work. The third space is where we are, where we are creative, where there aren't any rules, where we're able to express ourselves. And so um, I do how to lay out your office for that third space and how these things, uh, some people's third space is being nomadic and other people it's being a, co a cottage, you know, a cabin in the woods. But when I got into writing it, my first chapter kind of evolved and went, oh my God, we do this as kids. All we need is three cushions and a blanket and we build a fort. No parents allowed. We'll bring in snacks. We'll bring in a book. And that's our space. I love snacks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are we recording this too close to lunch? Yeah. <laughs> right. All joking aside, Rob, your passion. I mean, you just you can just you can just feel it. You and I have only met, I think, once face to face, but I feel like I've known you for so long because I just I I feel your passion. You can just you know our listeners are just going to feel it just coming right off of their screens if they're watching it or 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 listening to it. Um, and I just think that that is such a great 
I want to say tool. You're not a tool, but it's such a great, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right word. It's such a great attribute to have to help people be able to find their purpose and be able to express themselves. So if you were to give one piece of advice um, to those struggling to find purpose amidst their careers, what would it be? Don't listen to the jerks. Um. Uh, I mean, yeah, political great. Yeah, I can easily say don't you can swear, you can say the yeah, assholes. The yeah, yeah. Um, and it and it goes back to the, the, the that I remember um, when Sinead O'Connor was singing, and they booed her, and I forget the artist that came up and he put his arm around her and and he said, "Don't listen to the assholes." And uh, again, uh, it's it's <clears throat> like there's two levels. Don't listen to the assholes, and the first asshole is you. Mm. So you are going to be your own worst enemy always. Um, so you really have to uh, embrace that. Um, and then once you know that, I think because you know a lot of us, um, and I know I've been guilty of this, is 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 we chase relationships because that dilutes the time of self-awareness. It's like, I've got somebody else. I've got back. I've got a safety net. I've got, um, and we don't spend enough time on our own to really love ourselves, to understand ourselves and then move on. Uh, so I think that the biggest thing you can do is really get to know yourself. I love that. Yeah. I, I, I there's your fourth book. Uh, don't listen to the assholes. Uh, you know, write that down. I'll happy to write the foreword for you. Um, but, but I think what the illustration would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's powerful. I think it's, it, it's, there's so, we are so prone to doing exactly that. And the notion of, and I, and I love it because I, I can only, so I don't, this is a script I'm changing about myself, by the way. I, one of my scripts that I've, I, I've had for a long time is I'm not creative. And I'm calling bullshit on that because, uh, to, to, I, I think everyone is creative, has a creative, um, uh, bent to themselves and you only have to go back to as a child i was very as a child i was very creative at creating imaginary scenarios and stories and characters and and all of that and so the creative is in all of us uh but over the course of time you listen to enough assholes you listen to enough jerks that you hold back and you stop allowing that creative expression to come out so it's uh, uh, my mentor uh, who uh, wrote this poster here. If you don't believe in you, they don't believe in you. Um, that hits so hard. I love that so deeply. Um, so he just posted last week, and it's something I feel strongly about as well. Um, I'm calling bullshit. And it was about people talking about um, creativity and um, uh, uh alcohol and and uh drug use and oh we get creative when we put this stuff in and he said i'm calling bullshit on that and and i, I and i'm the same is that it is our way as adults to remove the walls to allow creativity some of us are just are lucky to not have walls sober um and um you know i always joke that uh, you know, Friday night at midnight in any city, there's a group of friends that are either starting a craft brewery or a band, mm. right? And it, and it's because they've had enough to drink and they're just like, oh, this is fun. Let's get creative. And it's like, you don't need to. So Rob, to your point, you know, uh, you're creative. Um, you just need to get over, you know, yourself. Tear down those walls. <laughs> Yep, there we go. <laughs> uh, Rob, if you think about kind of continuing on your journey of living a richly creative life and the daily practices or mindsets that you have in place right now and those routines that continue to keep you energized, engaged after uh, 30 years in this industry, what would you say would be one or two daily practices or mindset tips that you use as part of your day to day? Uh, so for me, it's, um, it's about the space that I work in. Like you can see behind me, um, it's just, it's, it's an open desk. Uh, there's no technology around it. I sit in a swivel chair and right now I'm facing my computer. So I have two zones in my office. 
Um, when I'm creating, when I've got to come up with the logo or write a, a, a line on something or whatever, I spin around and I am facing my creative wall. Um, and, and my Mexican wrestling mask and my kerplunk reminding me to play. Um, and, uh, I have no, there's no pings. There's no emails. There's nothing. I'm just there. I put on some music. I've got a nice turntable here, put on some music, depending on my mood and I can create. And then when it's like, Oh, this is a good idea. I just simply spin around. There's a computer waiting for me and then I can execute. Oh, I love um, that. So I'm using these things, um, for their best purposes. Um, and that's one thing that stemmed out of the, you know, three cushions and blanket, that, that whole idea of zones, um, and physical intention. So, um, that's important. When I face my computer, it's all post-it notes of things I've got to do, things like that. I really like that because you've been, you know, it's about being intentional with your space. And the first thing that popped into, into my mind is we've talked a lot about gratitude practices, uh, you know, reflection practices, meditation or whatever. And part of it is create the environment that is going to be able to support that. So uh, it's just it's fascinating listening to you talk about your environment and how you've designed it uh, so that it works for you. I love that. Oh, it's so good. Uh, we're, we're almost out of time. We got two more questions for you. Uh, I'm going to ask the first one and I'll leave the, la- the, the, the last question for Wendy to, to toss out your way. Uh, if you were able to go back to your younger self, that, that teenager feeling isolated, feeling misunderstood, feeling a little bit lost, and you could just kind of speak to that person who just is in that and, and not just to your younger self, but for those who are listening, who are in that space of feeling like I don't fit in, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I am misunderstood, all of those things. What would you say to that person? So to that person, uh, um, so there's two sizes. One is uh, to that person is uh, be yourself. Um, particularly now, it's great because we are niche marketed now. Like we are able through technology to speak to a smaller audience and have big impact. So the things that make you interesting you will find your tribe. You will find your people. They will find you as long as you stay the course to be consistent. Um, if I was to talk to myself uh, back in the day, it would be learn money. Um, I was not taught money in school. I was not ta- taught money by my parents. That's something that they took care of. And that's, you know, that's been a struggle for me. Um, people when I was young uh, um, that I was exposed to were wealthy people and They were people that I didn't like. They did not share my worldview. I found them gross. And so I spent a lot of my life um, not attracting money because I didn't want to become gross uh, like them. And it was only in recent years that I realized that money allows me to do the free coaching that I do for students uh, that allows me to take less of a salary at college to teach people in this profession, which I love doing. In order to do that, you need a certain amount of an income, right? So, uh, and that's something I had to talk to my students about is understand money, understand budgeting, understand those things. Um, and it'll just take a lot of pressure off of you. So good. So good. Um, final question, Rob, to wrap up. This has been just such a wonderful opportunity to hear your story and, and, uh, and talk with you. If you think about your ongoing journey, um, and living richly, and putting those two things together, uh, you can be creative this with this one. I know you can. Uh, what does living your best life mean to you? Living my best life. So um, I parallel this in my book. I talk about uh, success, except I call it success. Um, simply because anytime I reached what society considers success, I hated it. It was awful. Um, and so I struggle with, well, what does success mean? I don't understand. And I remember one day vividly, um, you know, when you, when your kids get older, they're crazy expensive. Right. And so, uh, my boys are, you know, we're, we're in their, their late teens, early twenties, and we would go out to a movie. We love going out to movies and then going out for drinks and snacks afterwards and talking about the movie. And, uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And I remember one night particularly, um, I was paying for our drinks at the bar and I stopped and I went, wow, at no point did I check my bank account. At no point was I concerned that I had enough money in my bank account to pay for this night with the boys. And, you know, a night like that can run $300, you know, or more. And, and I stopped and I went, 
there's, there's my success, uh, is that I'm able to do that and have this time with them. So for me, that was, uh, um, you know, that struggles living, um, living, um, a, a rich life for me is being able to express myself, um, as I see fit in whatever medium, uh, I just recently, <laughs> Rob doesn't know this. Um, I just re- recently started doing stand up comedy. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah. So I've been doing a bunch of that and it's been going super well. So it's just another way of expressing myself and just, um, the confidence and the freedom to be able to do that. Uh, I, I just absolutely love. And it was to push myself when I speak at conferences, I've got a safety net. I'm talking about creativity. It's something that I know intrinsically. So I can talk for hours about that confidently, but stand up's very different. Um, and so, uh, it's been a great, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, pushing yourself what's next and how do you keep going? Um, and that's one of them. It involves my writing, uh, it involves stage presence and, uh, it's been a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing to, to do. Oh, that's so good. And, and, uh, I was, I was trying to come up with some kind of a joke and tease you or say something, but I'm just going to leave it at, you know, I I'm excited for you. I, I genuinely, uh, uh, deeply respect and appreciate you. Uh, I value you as being someone in my life, uh, and so appreciate you taking the time to be a part of, of our, uh, of our episode of this episode and being a part of the living richly nation. Uh, you really do bring a lot to the table and I, I, I I'm grateful for you to be in my life, Rob. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, we've been, we've known each other for so many years and Again, particularly when you get to a certain age, your people are your people. Um, and sometimes you meet them later in life and sometimes you meet them early in life. And I'm just fortunate to, uh, to have met you, for example, um, later in life. And, and, uh, that's been very special to me. And, and, uh, this, uh, this experience was just so wonderful with you and Wendy. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. We want to thank all of you for taking the time to tune in, to listen in on the the episode today. Uh, if this has been speaking to you, you know some creatives in your life. What a great opportunity to not only just like and subscribe to the channel, but to share this out and to maybe share it with some people who who struggle with fitting in, who struggle and, and have maybe said to you, I feel like I'm misunderstood. What a great opportunity to give a gift to them by just sharing out this episode and saying you might uh, grab a few, uh, some great nuggets of truth here uh, listening to this episode. We want to encourage you to check out our website, livingrichly.me. Uh, one of the things that you can do is uh, join our 15-day Life Vision Challenge. So good. It has been amazing to see the feedback that we are getting over this challenge. And here's what one of the great things is it does, is it helps you write down (laughs) and figure out exactly who you are, what matters to you. And uh, that's the opportunity you have through the challenge. So we want to encourage you to sign up for that. It's completely free. uh, And it really is uh, a tool that we are providing to the Living Richly Nation as our way of giving back and support you on your journey. Thank you for being a part of our episode today. Thank you for uh, really supporting all that we're doing and we can't wait to see you next time.